Welcome to Aviation News Talk. Coming up on today's program, we have a ton of aviation news because manufacturers are introducing new products at two major GA trade shows this week, Sun and Fun in Lakeland, Florida, and Aero Friedrichshafen on the shores of Lake Constance in southern Germany. First, ForeFlight has a new feature that could save your life in an emergency, and Garmin has a new type of instrument approach that you can fly when you push the proc key on some of their GPSs. Harrison Ford has his day in court, plus many more general aviation stories, and my pilot report on flying the new 2017 Cirrus SR22 and the many new features found in the Perspective Plus glass cockpit. All this and more, and the news starts now. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about general aviation. I'm Max Truscott. If you enjoy the show, please tell your friends. Well, I'm guessing you probably have a smartphone or an iPad that you bring with you in the cockpit, but if you don't, you certainly are missing out a lot. There are some all-singing, all-dancing applications that assist pilots with just dozens of different types of tasks. Among them, you can find Garmin Pilot, uh, Wing X, and ForeFlight, which is probably the most popular of all of them. Revision 9 of Four Flight just came out with quite a few new features, but I wanted to talk with you in specific about one which I think could help save your life. It's called the Four Flight Glide Advisor. Now, interestingly, I saw something like this a couple years ago when I was doing some consulting for NASA Ames here in Mountain View, California. And it was essentially a, a separate app program that you could buy, which would allow you to uh, get guidance from your uh, iPad or iPhone in an emergency to figure out how far you could glide one of the, I don't recall which app it was. It may have been a Xavion, X-A-V-I-O-N, which is still available at uh, last I see here about $10 a month. But ForeFlight has now integrated the same capability inside their uh, popular ForeFlight application. According to their website, ForeFlight Glide Advisor helps you quickly assess your landing options in case you ever lose engine power in flight. Using terrain, GPS data, and your aircraft's best glide speed and ratio, ForeFlight shapes a glide ring around your uh, own aircraft icon on the moving map display. Setting up Glide Advisor is easy. Open the map settings menu and enable the Glide Advisor switch. Then create glide settings, including best glide speed and glide ratio manually, or you can, or you can choose from existing aircraft profiles, uh, which are included with the program. Now, once in flight, Glide Advisor will activate when you're above 200 feet AGL. Over flat terrain, it approximates a circle but hilly and mountainous areas, it's going to smoothly follow the contours of nearby terrain, reaching into the valleys and curving around mountains. Pretty cool tool. So if you look at the YouTube video or any of the graphics on the ForeFlight uh, website, you can see that essentially it's going to show you the area within it which you should be able to successfully glide. So if there's an airport within that area, you should be safe. Pretty cool feature. Some of the other things that they have added uh, with Revision 9, uh, integrated checklist. So if you would like to have uh, everything in one place, you can now use uh, some of the built-in POH uh, templates or create your own custom uh, checklist and use ForeFlight for that. They've also got a few other new features, uh, themes for day and night flight. I guess it changes the backlighting a little bit and also some enhancements to their new uh, logbook uh, capabilities. Basically, it allows you to see the total number of hours that you have uh, in an aircraft. Uh, and you can also enter a CFI certificate numbers, qualifications, and keep track of your uh, currency uh, within the uh, application. From Garmin, one of the world's largest general aviation avionics manufacturers, comes the announcement that they have added the visual approach capability to their line of Garmin 650 and 750 GPSs. This is a free software upgrade that's available for anyone who already has one of these units. That uh, feature was first announced back in January of 2017 when it was included in the upgrade to the G1000 and the Perspective. So any of the uh, G1000 NXI or Perspective Plus systems already have this capability. I use this uh, capability and we'll talk about it a little bit later when we talk about the uh, SR22. Essentially what it does is it uh, provides a way for an autopilot to follow what instrument pilots are used to flying as a visual approach at the end of an instrument flight provided they have the airport in sight. Essentially, it's based on a, a three-degree glide slope uh, from the threshold of the runway 
and also takes into consideration terrain and obstacle clearance. The idea is really to help pilots fly a stabilized approach and to provide uh, guidance to the autopilot uh, to fly the approach as well. And by the way, this could have come in real handy. You may recall we had a tragic accident in San Francisco a few years ago in which an airline pilot for a uh, foreign carrier was flying the visual approach to a runway 28 left or right at uh, San Francisco and uh, got low and slow and came up short and impacted the the end of the runway resulting in the three fatalities. So the visual approach is uh, something that, uh, you know, pilots who fly on the autopilot all the time may get a little nervous about. So this will uh, provide them some, uh, some extra help. Now, the system set up so that if the pilot is nearing a destination airport with a flight plan loaded, the GTN 650 or 750 will automatically provide a shortcut to make it quick and easy to load and activate a visual approach, provided that the aircraft is within five miles of the airport. Now, when I tried this uh, feature, I found that we had two options. We could either fly the so-called straight-in visual uh, approach, which brought us to a, about a five-mile final, or we could fly vectors to the visual approach, which brought us in about a 1.4-mile uh, final using a curved path to the, uh, to the runway. Probably the best feature is you can get both lateral and vertical guidance. So the autopilot will fly it uh, in both dimensions uh, down to a point where you can then take over and land. Also, as part of the software upgrade, uh, pilots who are flying into airports that don't have WAS capability, now that's going to be airports mostly out of the United States, will be able to get vertical guidance with this software upgrade uh, for LNAV plus V approaches. So if you're in another country, you're flying into an airport with a GPS approach, uh, it sounds like this upgrade will now give you an advisory glide slope, even though you don't have WAS available uh, within your country. In other Garmin news, and this comes from AOPA, Garmin announced that their G5 electronic flight instrument is set to receive FAA approval for installation as a replacement horizontal situation indicator, or HSI, in type certificate fixed-wing general aviation aircraft. Well, let's take a step back and talk about what the, uh, the G5 is. So in July of 2016, this instrument was announced, but it was only available for experimental aircraft. Essentially, what you can think of it is as a, uh, a direct replacement for your attitude indicator. So if you have a round gauge aircraft, you can pop that three and one eighth instrument out of that hole. You can drop in this uh, square electronic uh, device, which is going to provide your attitude indicator. And also, by the way, it's going to provide uh, airspeed uh, altitude information as well. They later added software that allowed it to be configured as an HSI, which would be a direct replacement for the heading indicator or directional gyro uh, in an experimental aircraft. Well, that's great for experimental aircraft, but the really big news is now these instruments are going to be available for uh, certificated aircraft, and there's a list of about 600 makes and models. So if you've got a small aircraft, pretty good chance that uh, your plane is on the list. The uh, pricing on this is really spectacular. It's a single G5, $2,500, which includes the installation kit, a magnetometer, four-hour backup battery, uh, and if you were going to uh, have it drive a, uh, a GPS or an autopilot, uh, that raises the price up to about 3000 However, you can get a pair of these instruments starting in lo as low as $4,600. Now, it is a little bit less expensive if you're on the experimental aircraft side. I'm looking at the Garmin website right now, and it says that uh, for one of these instruments, it starts at uh, 1199 so about $1,200. Basically, it's a three and one eighth inch uh, a square type uh, instrument, and it's got backup power. So even if your aircraft does lose power, you will still continue to, uh, you know, be able to see these instruments for up to either two or four hours, depending upon the size of your backup battery. Pretty spectacular capability. In other uh, avionics news, it's been announced that the TrueTrack autopilot which uh, is very familiar to uh, experimental aircraft owners, is also going to be approved for use in certificated aircraft. Now, this is going to drastically reduce the price of autopilots uh, in certificated aircraft. And my hope is that uh, folks who have older airplanes will strongly consider installing one of these because I think it's a great way to reduce your workload and overall uh, improve your safety. AOPA also has another story out that Aspen Avionics is offering a discount 
on the VFR version of their PFD. Now, essentially, that's the same type of capability that you would have if you bought two of the Garmin G5s that we were just talking about. And I believe Aspen was the first manufacturer to offer an electronic instrument that was a direct drop-in for that uh, three and a one-eighth inch hole that most instruments uh, fit. This uh, essentially would cover up two of those holes the attitude indicator and your directional gyro. Uh, and they're going to drop the price uh, to $3,995 only during the month of April. So if you've uh, really been interested in getting one of these Aspens, this might be the time to, to do that. They mentioned also that this does have uh, ADS-B type uh, display capability on the device. And we have more avionics news, this time about ADS-B. And stick around, we'll get to the airplanes here in just a moment. This one's really fascinating. U-Avionics, a manufacturer of avionics for the UAV segment, otherwise known as drones, announced this week that they're going to have four new ADS-B-related products. It's a California-based company. They plan to leverage the potential volume in UAS market to drive down the price of ADS-B for manned general aviation aircraft while producing products of much smaller physical size. This uh, comes from AvWeb, and uh, UAvionics announced four products at the Sun and Fun show in Lakeland, uh, Florida. Their Echo ESX will be available next month at uh, $1,699. It is, however, only available for light sport and experimental aircraft. And finally, on the ADS-B front, Dynon, a manufacturer of experimental aircraft, has announced a dual-band ADS-B receiver for uh, $795. Uh, they do mention that unlike other portable ADS-B receivers, that this can be coupled with a Modest transponder so that you will be able to get uh, full uh, radar. So you may not be aware of this, but if you have a portable ADS-B receiver, you're not seeing all of the traffic up there. You're only seeing traffic that's being shown to other aircraft that have ADS-B out. This will allow you to uh, couple to an ADS-B out to transmitter, so you should be able to see targets for your aircraft as well. And just a quick reminder, we are exactly 1,000 days away from January 1st, 2020. That's when ADS-B must be installed in all aircraft here in the United States, unless, of course, you're not going to fly above 10,000 feet uh, or inside a Class Charlie or Class uh, Bravo area. Now let's turn to light sport aircraft. At Sun and Fun this week, according to uh, this article in Flying Magazine, a new uh, SD-4 was introduced. It's an LSA. It comes from the uh, Eagle International Aircraft Company. They're calling it the Viper SD-4, and it comes from the Czech Republic, which, by the way, is the home of many light sport uh, aircraft designs. The starting price is $89,000. It's an all-metal aircraft. The base model comes with traditional round-gauge instruments. There are a number of uh, avionics options from Dynon and Garmin, and you can also have uh, a couple of different uh, Rotax engine options and for powers ranging from 80 horsepower to 115 horsepower. They say the top-of-the-line SD-4 will retail for around $160. And, yep, that's what we've seen. A lot of these light sports uh, start out at uh, low prices, but by the time they're fully loaded, the uh, the dollar amount gets up pretty high. But they do come in, uh, with a, a BRS a parachute system, and they can be equipped for glider towing. Also from uh, Sun and Fun, the B-Light has just announced their two-seat experimental chipper. Now, this looks like a, a little tiny Piper Cub. It's uh, yellow and tail dragger, really pretty darn cute. Uh, basically, the uh, CEO of uh, B-Lite, James Whidbey, said, I wanted to take my wife flying in an aircraft of my own design and implement my years of learning about aircraft structure design. I focused on aspects of aircraft design that are really important to me and many pilots whom I've met. This includes cost reduction over other designs, ease of construction, low weight, good short field performance, and a variety of inexpensive two- and four-stroke engine options. It says here that Chipper will be sold as an experimental kit. A limited number of kits are available at the introductory price of, this is pretty amazing, $89.95. So just under $9,000 for the airframe kit with a tail dragger completion option of $2,300 or a tricycle completion option of $2,600. You can find more information at Belite, that's B-E-L-I-T-E, aircraft.com. And finally, in light sport news, Garmin introduced a new version of their G3X touch display, which is for light sport and experimental aircraft. Previously, they had a uh, landscape version, so it was a 10.6-inch display. Now they've introduced uh, portrait versions, which go vertically, and it's a 7-inch display. So more new things from Garmin. 
Now let's turn our attention to international news. I mentioned earlier that the Aero Friedrichshafen General Aviation Show is going on this week in Germany, and there's going to be a demonstration of the Volta. Now this is a French-designed electric helicopter, all electric. They had their uh, first, what they describe as world record flight. That was uh, 15 minutes long. And of course, world record because it was the first electric helicopter. And if you look at the video, they spent the entire time hovering. Well, <laughs> I guess they're uh, testing the batteries and uh, the general uh, you know capability of the, uh, the power plant in that aircraft. They say that they envision designing a two-seat version for flight instruction, and they would expect that that would have about 40 minutes of autonomy. I got to tell you, having low-cost electric trainers for fixed-wing uh, aircraft has been kind of the holy grail for reducing uh, the cost of flight instruction. Hopefully, the same would happen if we can get a low-cost helicopter trainer as well. Also from Friedrich Schaffen, Remos, the manufacturer of light sport aircraft, announced the delivery of their first GXIS that conforms to German ultralight standards. The difference between uh, this and earlier models is this has a fuel-injected uh, Rotax uh, 912 uh, sport engine. Also, it includes what they call the Smart Start system, and essentially it's single-button pushing uh, to start the uh, aircraft. They go on to say that uh, the students in the flight school will profit because the engine consumes about 10% less fuel than the carbureted version of their uh, aircraft. By the way, I've flown to other versions of the Remos, really excellent uh, light sport aircraft. Now, there's an international aspect to this story, which is why I've included it here. And unfortunately, it doesn't have a happy ending for a lot of students who are out a lot of money. This is a story that uh, retells itself over and over every few years here in the United States. This comes from the Fresno Bee, and it says, Money Woes Ground Longtime Fresno Pilot School, Leaving Foreign Students in the Lurch. I was first contacted about this uh, oh, several days ago when a journalist was looking for uh, background information about it. But what it says is that the shutdown of Mazzelli Flying Service, uh, based at the Fresno Yosemite International Airport, ceased full-time instruction this week because of serious financial problems. The shutdown leaves dozens of international students in the U.S. on student visas training to be airline pilots in Taiwan, Indonesia, and India in the lurch to complete their instruction after they've paid tens of thousands of dollars up front for these classes. Now, one of the students mentioned that they had paid as much as $58,000 up front to uh, be able to get their private, commercial, and I believe uh, instrument rating. They said that most of the students here are enrolled at uh, the school are from Taiwan. They said that the uh, program had long been popular with students in Asia because of its good reputation and that they provide all the training that Asian airlines require for uh, pilots. Uh, They also said that uh, the 300-hour commercial pilot training course uh, would also include uh, multi-engine certificate as well for that uh, cost, and it would take up to 12 to 18 uh, months to predict. So the enclosure is going to affect between 25 and 30 employees, as well as the company's uh, 24-owned aircraft as well. And unfortunately, it looks like uh, many of these students will be out all of their money. Incidentally, there was a flight school that closed perhaps five or six years ago here in California, which led to a bill in uh, California AB 48, which uh, banned flight schools and flight instructors from accepting more than $2,500 in advance. So perhaps it didn't apply to foreign students, or perhaps the school wasn't uh, following that uh, California regulation. Regardless, I think the important thing for anyone who is looking to learn to fly is do not pay a large sum of money up front, even if you're offered a larger discount. You know, perhaps you might want to put down 10% or 20%, but don't put all the money up front because you'll be at great risk. And this past week, the airlines and the government here in the United States continued to bang the drum for privatization of the air traffic control system. Though in an interview in the uh, Dallas Business Journal, American Airlines CEO Doug Parker said, no, it's not privatization. Instead, he's advocating that simply $56 billion worth of government assets be turned over to a not-for-profit company, which would then allow them to receive billions of dollars in bond financing for improvements. Yes, I agree with you, sir. If it were privatization, you would have to pay for all of those assets. If they're being given it to you, well, that's, that's a government giveaway. But I think the most disingenuous part of the article is when he says, quote, a flight from Dallas-Fort Worth to Philadelphia takes about 30 minutes longer than it did in 1979 because the U.S. air traffic control system hasn't kept pace with the rest of the world. Well, you have to take a look and see what equipment the airliners were, pardon me, the airlines were using back in 1979. 
Uh, there was a large mix of, remember these, the 727. There were still some 707s kicking around, certainly a lot of 747s. And oh, guess what? Those three airplanes topped the list of the fastest uh, airliners that were ever produced. Uh, they burned a lot more fuel. They flew faster. And of course, you may recall fuel was cheap back then. The airlines were you know, anxious to get you there quickly. What else happened? Airliners started to stretch. So the 737-800 is slower than the 500 and the 300 and the 200. So as airliners have been elongated, they've gotten slower. Not only that, we now have airlines worried about where they're going to show up on the on-time report that the Commerce Department holds. So yeah, I think there are a lot of reasons the airlines are slower than they were back in 1979. And I'm guessing that air traffic control is not one of those reasons. Later this week, according to the Hill.com, members of the Trump administration and Congress are visiting Canada to examine the country's privatized air traffic control system. Air Transportation uh, Secretary Elaine Chow, who is the FAA administrator's boss, and Representative Bill Schuster, chairman of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, which is pushing for privatization of ATC. The visit comes two weeks after Trump publicly endorsed the idea of separating air traffic control from the federal government. What's important to know is that September is when the FAA's legal authority expires, and so Congress is working on reauthorization legislation, and that bill will most likely be the prime legislative vehicle for trying to spin off air traffic control. Well, it's relatively rare that we have stories of drunk pilots on the news, but since there are two of them this week, I thought it would be worth mentioning briefly. From RatingsAlerts.com comes a story from Southern California, Los Angeles, of a single-engine Cherokee which departed Temecula and was headed for San Diego. However, it continued to overfly its destination by about 70 miles before clipping a stop sign and landing in an empty parking lot. It was while officers were in, uh, interrogating the suspect that they realized that he was uh, most likely intoxicated and arrested him. The 58-year-old pilot was uh, facing a misdemeanor DUI charge and was uh, released on $1,000 worth of bail. And I think this pilot can also count on having his license revoked. Now, there's another story from Avweb out of uh, Canada. Sunwing's airline pilot, who passed out in his cockpit in a 737 back on December 31st, has been sentenced to eight months in jail by a Canadian court. He was a, a Slovak working in Canada on a work permit, had to be awakened by the flight crew. The story is that uh, on the day in question, he admitted to drinking a full bottle of vodka between 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. when a dispatcher called him to inquire about why he hadn't reported for his 7 a.m. flight. He got to the aircraft shortly thereafter and promptly passed out in the left seat after first losing his way to the airport. At the end of the article, it says that uh, it's unlikely that he will ever fly again. Well, actually, I did have an opportunity years ago to uh, meet the author of uh, a book about drunk flying. So Joe Balzer wrote Flying Drunk, the true story of a Northwest Airlines flight, three drunk pilots, and one man's fight for redemption. So Joe did some pretty hard time in a federal penitentiary, but after he got out, he was able to regain all of his certificates. They had all been stripped from him. He made it all the way back to his ATP certificate and was able to uh, continue a career of flying. He has over 15,000 hours and now is a motivational speaker. So I think that's really the exception to the rule. Uh, but yeah, I think that anybody who uh, has a DUI conviction probably is going to have a hard time getting a job in the industry again. And to wrap up the news, Harrison Ford had his day in court, and he is uh, now done and free to fly again. We talked about this incident last week in which Ford landed on a taxiway at the John Wayne uh, Airport in Orange County, California. And it looks like the outcome was exactly as I thought it would be. I mentioned a couple possibilities, one that he might get a warning or two that he might be required to do remedial flight training. Looks like the latter is what happened, and that's uh, pretty typical for these kinds of incidents. His uh, lawyer pointed out that he had cooperated with the investigators. He had been a licensed pilot for more than 20 years with more than 5,000 hours of flight uh, experience and had never been the subject of an FAA enforcement action. Now, there was an aviation uh, safety consultant who was quoted in this article 
who said that uh, his candor and long history of supporting aviation safety may have also been a factor in the decision to cut him some slack. Well, I heartily disagree. I don't think he was cut any slack at all. Uh, the outcome, frankly, was almost identical to the outcome that I've heard for other people in a similar situation. So anyway, hats off to Harrison Ford. His wings are no longer clipped, and hopefully he's having fun flying again. And that's the news for this week. Next up, my pilot report on flying the new 2017 Cirrus SR22. Coming up in a few minutes, we'll get to a listener question that came in from a controller who was asking whether or not LPVs are the most accurate approaches and whether they're considered precision approaches. And he asked whether I prefer an ILS or an RNAV approach. But first, let's talk about the 2017 SR-22. Now, often when I'm in an aircraft, I'm in the right seat, and you could arguably say that I'm just along for the ride, but not actually flying the aircraft. In this case, I was in the left seat, and I spent an hour and a half flying the new 2017 all by myself. Well, with the uh, Cirrus dealer by my side, pointing out a lot of really cool new features, and I just wanted to share with you more of the reasons of why this is my favorite aircraft. I've flown about 85 different types of aircraft, and I've type rated in, in a couple of jets, the uh, the Eclipse and the Phenom 100, but the Cirrus has always remained my all-time favorite aircraft and continues to be so. And I guess there are a few reasons why it's my favorite. One is the company has continued to innovate year in, year out, all kinds of new technology features in the aircraft, and they really put the uh, the industry upside down on its head. I think uh, things were pretty slow moving uh, in the industry prior to Cirrus uh, introducing their aircraft in 1999, and everybody had to step up their game uh, when Cirrus came along. And then, of course, for me, it's just a heck of a lot more fun being down uh, low enough to watch the ground go by than being up there at flight level 410 looking at the top of the cloud. So that's another reason I would rather be down uh, down in the Cirrus. So getting back to the particulars of uh, this aircraft, first, the cockpit is the same that's in the Vision Jet. So anybody who is interested in stepping up into the air that aircraft will be extremely familiar with it after flying the, uh, the 2017 SR-22. It has keyless entry, so you just uh, click a little key fob and it opens the aircraft. When you do that, it also illuminates tube lighting on the wingtip, which is very, very visible, and it stays on until the aircraft climbs all the way through 300 feet. Now, here's here's a funny little thing. On the front of the pilot seat, there is a little cell phone storage pocket, so it's just a convenient little place to, uh, to keep your cell phone. The yaw damper in this aircraft goes on at 200 feet and then off again as you uh, pass through 300 feet when you're coming into land. And so that's uh, pretty important. I've heard from some pilots who told me that they forgot and left the yaw damper on and couldn't understand why they had difficulty controlling the aircraft when they landed. So it's nice that uh, Cirrus has decided to make it automatic that the uh, yaw damper will turn off as you get uh, close to the ground. Now, one of the first things you see as you start up the uh, aircraft is a new weight and balance page. Now, this comes from uh, the, uh, some of the jets like the Mustang jet, which used the G1000, had something similar. You would enter the uh, the pilot and co-pilot weights, the passenger weights, the fuel, the TKS, the baggage, and so on. And then it goes ahead and plots directly on the screen on a graph uh, where you fall on the weight and balance chart. Now, here's a simple thing, flight plans. It's always been annoying to me that when I fly somewhere, unless I remember to store that flight plan, it's going to be gone as soon as I turn off the aircraft. Well, Cirrus saves that flight plan for you. So when you start up the airplane, you can simply invert it and then fly your return trip home. Another nice little feature like that, the transponder automatically goes to 1200 when you shut down. There have been at least a couple of times when I've gotten ready to take off and I didn't notice that somebody had left the old code, uh, not a 1200 code, uh, in the aircraft and took off uh, squawking somebody else's uh, old code. Now, the keyboard is a QWERTY keyboard. So just like you would see on a computer keyboard, it's one of the few aircraft that has that. Got to tell you, it's much nicer typing on something like that than a keyboard that goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, one of the nice features, which we talked about earlier in the show, is the visual approach. So using the proc key, instead of uh, choosing an instrument approach, you can choose to load the visual, which will give you a straight in from a five mile final or load it with uh, vectors to the visual approach, which will bring you on a curved path from wherever you happen to be to set you up for a, a 1.4 mile final. Not only that, you can then use the VNV key on the autopilot to follow that descent profile uh, down directly onto the visual approach. 
Now here's a biggie. You can actually display real sectionals uh, as well as IFR high and low altitude and route charts on the MFD. And everyone knows you're going to find a lot more detail on the sectionals than you would typically find on maps that uh, are available in glass cockpit uh, computers. Also on the PFD, you can place a map inside the HSI. I'm not sure I would do that, but uh, some people might want to do that. And boy, this is a nice feature, ground speed. I'm always hunting around for the ground speed display, and now they've added it uh, right at the bottom of the airspeed tape, right next to the true airspeed. So in one spot, uh, you can pretty much uh, take in indicated true and uh, ground speed in the same part of the PFD. Another nice feature, and I think this comes from uh, R9, which was uh, a previous avionics suite uh, made by a third party. When you dial up uh, frequency on the comm, it tells you right there next to the frequency which facility you're talking to. So if you're at the ground at uh, Sacramento, it's going to say Sacramento ground when that frequency is uh, dialed in. Also, your call sign shows up on the PFD near the uh, comms, which is pretty handy. And then you also have the ability to export uh, uh, flight plans directly from your iPhone or iPad uh, back and forth uh, to the, uh, the Cirrus Perspective uh, avionics. So you can uh, send those flight plans in either direction. A lot of pilots tell me that they do flight planning at home and they want to be able to uh, load that directly into the, uh, the aircraft. And th this will now save them a lot of time. Some of the other things, there are uh, dual core uh, processors uh, in these systems, and people have estimated that they run about 10 times faster than the previous uh, Cirrus Perspective uh, avionics. So that's uh, really, uh, you know, it's nice to not have to wait for the screens to update. And those screens have slowed down over the, uh, what, eight or nine years that the Perspective has come out as more and more software has been uh, loaded onto them. It still has the um, you know the famous blue level button on the autopilot. So if you find yourself in an unusual attitude, you can just push that blue button, see if that's going to solve the problem. And if it doesn't, of course, then you can go for the uh, the parachute. There are a number of other features. For example, uh, it's got a um, Iridium uh, cell phone integrated into the, uh, or pardon me, an Iridium satellite phone, not a cell phone, integrated into the system. In fact, we we tried to uh, call my wife while I was in the aircraft, but wouldn't you know, I used the wrong area code, so we didn't uh, didn't reach her. Oh well. And there are also some uh, similar changes to the SR20. So uh, that, of course, is the the smaller, slower uh, twin of the uh, the SR22. Uh, the SR20, in addition to getting all of these Perspective Plus electronics, also has a horsepower upgrade. So the engine is going to an IO390 with the 215 horsepower. It has the uh, the same wingtip lights and the same uh, next generation perspective. Also, the useful load on the aircraft has been increased by 150 pounds. So if you're doing an SR20, you're going to find that uh, you'll probably get at least one extra person in the airplane above and what you, above and beyond what you've done in the past. So okay, you've noticed I've talked mostly about the avionics, and that's because the flying is pretty much the same as uh, any of the previous series. But if you haven't flown one, let me just tell you about that a little bit. It's really rock solid uh, in flight. It's got a relatively heavy uh, wing loading, in other words, pounds per square and so it rides through the turbulence reasonably well. This aircraft has a, a maximum gross weight of uh, 3,600 pounds. And the, uh, let's see, oh, the flaps. You can put the first notch of flaps in at 150 knots, which is awesome. The older SR-22s, you had to get down to 119. Pretty easy to uh, to do that. Now, if you were to ever use the uh, parachute, God forbid, uh, the max parachute deployment speed is about 140. Uh, so you'd want to slow down to that before uh, pulling the parachute. All the other speeds, pretty much the same. You're going to be flying about 100 on downwind, about 90 on base, and about 80 uh, on final. And if you're uh, climbing out, then your VY speed is going to be just slightly above 100 knots as you're climbing out. And best of all, you can expect climb rates of probably in the area of 1,300 feet per minute. Cruise speeds, well, for the not normally aspirated aircraft at the lower altitudes, you might be looking at, uh, oh, perhaps around 170, 175 knots, depending on what percentage of power you're going. If you were a turbocharged uh, Cirrus and you were flying up in the teens, then you'd be seeing numbers that uh, it would probably be getting up around 
around 190, a little bit uh, higher than that. So all I can tell you is that flying the Cirrus has always been a joy for me. And if you're thinking about uh, buying either a used one or a new one, contact me. I've got a lot of information about the different model gears, and I'll be happy to help you uh, sort out uh, which one makes the most sense for you. Also, sometimes when uh, you're looking at uh, prices comparing new and old, you might not be aware of all the factors that can actually make uh, the new aircraft uh, more uh, cost effective after you factor in uh, things like maintenance and taxes and things like that. Well, there you have it. That's my report on flying the new 2017 Cirrus SR22 with a Perspective Plus glass cockpit. In a moment, our listener question. Yeah, welcome back to the program. Our question this week comes from Michael, who is an air traffic controller and a friend of mine. I taught him how to fly many years ago. Michael says, in part, got a question regarding RNAV approaches. Is LPV the most accurate, and is it considered a precision approach? Do you prefer ILS or RNAV? And I've shortened the question because he had a lot of other uh, pieces to this, and there were so many acronyms, <laughs> I knew it was going to be difficult to explain it to you. So let me just uh, go ahead and tell you RNAV. RNAV stands for Area Navigation, and typically most GA pilots would consider a GPS approach an RNAV approach, though there are some non-GPS RNAV approaches that the airliners fly. Uh, LPV, that stands for Localizer Performance with Vertical Guidance. So in other words, it's got the characteristics of a localizer, which means you're flying into a, a kind of a funnel that decreases in width as you get closer to the airport, and you have vertical guidance as you uh, descend along uh, through that uh, funnel. And that's what uh, you would use when flying a GPS approach with vertical guidance. Finally, do you prefer ILS or RNAV? So the ILS would be Instrument Landing System, and we just explained RNAV. So well, I responded to him in part that LPV has the lowest minimums that you can fly with a WAS-capable GPS. Now, of course, those are the newer GPSs. The original GPSs installed in aircraft 20 years ago were not WAS-capable. The first uh, WAS-capable GPS was introduced in 2003. That was the uh, Garmin 480, uh, though it was uh, introduced by a different company. Uh, so the typical minimums on these approaches are 20, I'm uh, sorry, 200 to 250 feet above the ground. So they are quite low, often as low as a uh, typical ILS, but sometimes a little bit uh, higher. And then in terms of uh, preference, well, I generally prefer the, uh, the LPV approaches since I can set up the autopilot 50 or a hundred miles away and automate to everything all the way down, including uh, all the step downs that may occur uh, prior to uh, intercepting the, uh, the glide slope. So that's why I prefer the, uh, the, uh, RNAV approaches, the RNAV LPV approaches to the ILSs, but uh, both will do the job for you. And, uh, frankly, the ILS is probably a little bit simpler, uh, to dial in. So if you don't know how to use the uh, the GPS uh, extremely well, you're probably better off flying ILS so that you uh, don't get yourself into trouble. And that just about wraps it up for this week's edition of Aviation News Talk. Thanks for joining us. You can find our show notes at the website, aviationnewstalk.com. If you listen to us on the iPhone podcast app, you can just touch the cover artwork at the top of your display and see the show notes and contact information there. And remember, if you have any questions for us that we can answer on the show, just leave a message on our voicemail box at 650-967-2500. So until next time... Fly safely and keep the blue side up.